We want to show you Work two harder. very contrasting <laughs> messages from two former presidents on the topic of dictatorships. Take a look. We will not be intimidated by the threats of dictators that they will regard as a breach of international law or as an act of war our aid to the democracies which dare to resist their aggression. They will not wait for an act of war on our part. They did not wait for Norway or Belgium or the Netherlands to commit an act of war. You are promising America tonight you would never abuse power as retribution against anybody. Except for day one. Yeah. Except Look, what? He's going to prison. Except for day one. Meaning? I want to close the border and I want to drill, that's drill, not a, that's, drill. That's not, no, no. that's not retribution. I got I'm going to be, I'm going to be, you know, he keeps, <laughs> I love this guy. He says, you're not going to be a dictator, are you? I said, no, 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 other than day one. Okay, so what you saw first was 1941, uh, former President Franklin Delano Roosevelt standing up to dictators during World War II, and then Donald Trump just last year vowing to be a dictator himself for a day if he returns it's to the It's a long White day. It's a long day. It has been a long day. Uh, <laughs> to we'll the White House next year. Joining us now, <laughs> U.S. editor for The Economist, John Prudeau. The magazine's latest issue takes a look at the strength of democracy here at home with a cover story entitled, and it will be my first question, is America dictator proof? John, what's the answer? Hi, Mika. I'm sorry. I feel like I'm not going to cheer you up after those rather uh, gloomy <laughs> poll numbers that were, uh, were getting you down earlier. I mean... <laughs> There are a couple of ways to look at this. There's one way, which is to look at Donald Trump and this whole debate, which, frankly, he started when he made those remarks, I think it was last year, about being a dictator on day one. Mm -hmm. And we all go around in circles trying to figure out, you know, look at what he actually did when he was in office last time around, look at some of the things he said. There are debates, good debates, about what he'd really do. But there's another way to look at that question, which is to depersonalise it and to take Trump out of the picture and say, OK... If America were to elect somebody who were both malign and competent, and I have real questions over whether Donald Trump is competent enough to, to pull this off, but were that to happen, how strong are the checks and balances? And there, um, there's, there's mixed news, I, I, I've got to say. I mean, there are some really substantial checks on presidential authority. If you look at how dictatorships have functioned elsewhere, often a military coup is involved. That's impossible in America, I think. You know, America's military is one of the strongest institutions in the country with deeply embedded democratic norms. But then I think it's also the case, you look at some of the formal checks on the presidency, and one of the things we've learned since 2016 is that they just don't work. You know, impeachment is one of the biggest checks written into the Constitution as a, as a restraint on tyranny. And we've had ample proof over the past few years that that just doesn't work. And then and if you look down the list, there are a whole bunch of emergency powers that the president has, which somebody who is really determined, I think, could exercise to subvert uh, important democratic norms in, in quite a worrying way. So I'm, I'm not saying that Trump is going to do this, but I think somebody could. So, but, John, in terms of restraints upon the presidency or restraints upon a candidate running for president who happened to have sat in the Oval Office for four years, uh, what would restraints or what would, what would the restraints do to someone who, for instance, just yesterday, Donald Trump just yesterday more than suggested that the Department of Justice under President Biden had authorized use of lethal force to maybe take a shot at Donald Trump, maybe try an assassination attempt on Donald, on Donald Trump. What do we do about a candidate like that? What kind of restraints would work against someone clearly not within the bounds of any restraint? Well, so then I think we, you have to look back at what he did when he was in office. And again, this is the question that journalists like me tied ourselves up in knots trying to, trying to figure out. I mean, look back at some of the memoirs that people who served in his cabinet, you know, Mark Esper, writes in his memoir about Donald Trump asking if it was possible 
for him to give an order to shoot people in the leg, shoot protesters in the leg in, in 2020. And he was told, no, no, you can't do that. And then we get into the question of, well, how, how serious was that? You know, is that a thing he really would have done? Or is it like the remarks you guys were talking about earlier on contraception, where he says a thing and it's not quite clear, you know, how serious he is? So in terms of restraints in, in, in a case like that, um, I, I think those norms around the American military are hugely important. I mean, I spoke to a bunch of people who, who served in pretty senior positions in uh, the Trump administration, and, and they pointed out to me that the, you know, one of them said the DOD is not in a rush to operate mm -hmm. against American citizens. So those kind of checks are really important. But I think the striking thing is if you look through the Constitution, look through the law, it's a lot of those things that aren't written down, norms mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. DOJ independence, norms around how the military would behave in time of crisis. Those are the things that are the real guarantees rather than the stuff that's written down. And I think if you ask most Americans what they're taught in the civics class, it would be, well, the Constitution is the guarantee. Um, and I'm not sure that, that I think that might be a bit too comforting. Yeah, John, I think one of the things that Trump taught all of us is that democracy is partly laws and it's partly norms and traditions. And if you have a candidate who's willing to ignore those norms and traditions, then the democracy gets put under threat. One of the things that people talk about and the Trump campaign talks about openly wanting to do is under this provision of Schedule F, it's called, taking a whole group of civil servants who are non-political and making them effectively political appointees, which could... Um, change America's democracy, not just for this presidency, the next presidency, but presumably for years and years and years to come. Do you think he, we hear that the Trump campaign is sort of more organized and more efficient and has more of a plan? Do you think it is up to the task of doing something like that? And how much of a threat would that be to democracy? It's definitely more organized than was the case prior to 20, uh, 2016. I mean, I'm sure you've spoken to lots of the people I've spoken to, Cathy, and in MAGA aligned think tanks and you know their plans there are quite well developed that said the federal bureaucracy is a huge beast and you know you talk to people who've served in the White House served in the administration getting it to do anything is quite tough um, there are you know 25,000 odd lawyers in the federal government and so a Trump administration could come in really well organized with a really good uh, well not good but you know a determined thorough plan <laughs> And I think it would struggle to get all of these things done. I don't think the federal bureaucracy, I don't think you can kind of wave a wand and make this stuff happen. Mm. That said, you can undermine some really important, uh, some yeah. really important norms and you can do a lot of stuff, right? So oh, I, I, I guess it depends, you know, you need to sort of calibrate your degree of alarmism. I think if you, you know, look way back, um, I think George Washington had a staff of four when he was, when he was president. The federal bureaucracy has obviously grown a huge amount over the course of the 20th century. Um, it was interesting, the clips of FDR that we were watching a little earlier, Mika. I mean, FDR did serve three terms, right? Which is something that Donald Trump was sort of teasing us about the other day. But that, the existence of that federal, federal bureaucracy now, which isn't written into the Constitution, is a pretty important check, I think. And I don't think you can yeah, sweep it away on day one. No. no, not day one. And it is fascinating. George Washington only had four people working for him. And of course, two of those uh, were employed just to separate Jefferson and Hamilton. So he really was working effectively with two people. U.S. Editor for The Economist, John Trudeau, thank you so much. Um, Claire, you know, uh, go, I'm, so, I'm so glad John brought up George Washington because I was going to come to you and just say that since 1789, the United States has depended on the goodwill of the, pre the sitting president of the United States to make the Constitution work. And we learned in the negative with Donald Trump, if you don't have that, you don't have a Constitution. I mean, Richard Nixon, right? people talk about Richard Nixon. There is no comparison of Nixon and Trump. Nixon lost in 60. He may have complained about it. He may have, his people may have thought for good reason that Illinois wasn't counted uh, the way that it should have been counted. But he said, I'm not going to put the country through that. He conceded. When the Supreme Court came back unanimously and said, you have to turn over the tapes, Nixon knew his presidency was over. Why? Because he played within the constitutional guardrails and the goodwill that we expected of presidents. Not so with Donald yeah, Trump. So what, what do we do moving forward? 
Yeah, and let's not forget uh, Bush Gore. Uh, you know, our country oh, was my gosh. on, on yes. a knife's edge, on a knife's edge. Uh, and, and the Supreme Court spoke, and there were a whole lot of people, especially people that were really familiar with the law, that were very unhappy with the Supreme Court decision. And what did Al Gore do? He did what was best for the country. We do not have that guy in Donald Trump. He is not going to do what's best for the country. And I'll tell you what worries me the most about this. What worries me the most is that bright line dividing our military from our politics. And if you all remember, Donald Trump sent over some of his idiot minions to the Department of Defense at the very end of his administration. And frankly, that was part of the reason that we had the, the big mess up where the National Guard was not called out quickly enough when we had um, we had his rioters trying to stab out the eyes of police officers with flagpoles. Um, and I, I worry that our military um, is going to be weaponized in a way that would be uh, so damaging to our country. He's talking about using the military in a domestic way. That is not what our founders wanted. Our founders did not want the, the military, the federal military, to be used to abuse the rule of law in this country that is, has been so clear about how the rule of law is supposed to work in America. And uh, that's why I've said a, a number of times, I think the military leaders who know what Donald Trump is capable of, who have retired, have a, a, a really a strong obligation to speak out against Donald yeah. Trump between now and November. That's the, the real Mattis, test. Well, they Kelly, cut TV spots all of the those. Yeah. There's also, look, there's a remedy to all of this. It's called the United States Congress. It's not called the Supreme Branch for nothing, but it has to stop acting like a quasi-parliament that supports its president, each party, yes. when its president is in power, right. and actually use, be jealous of its own authority and use it. And that's how you put a check on a president who doesn't want to observe particular norms or laws and keep democracy humming. So, 